how does, how does Quran want you to see reality? How does it want you to see the world, see yourself, see God, see your future, understand your past? All of that are the questions answered in the Makkan Quran. The, the, the fundamental questions, the existential questions are the subject of the Makkan Quran. By, it's through the stories of the prophets, or it's through reflecting on creation, or the story of the original human being, Adam alayhi salam, or the story of our future in Judgment Day, or heaven and hell. Those details are which, which part of the Quran? The Meccan Quran. Why? Because first you have to build the world view. This is how you view the world. Now that you view the world in this way, your framework is right, now Allah will tell you what is right and what is wrong, what is halal and what is haram. That happens where? That doesn't happen in Mecca mostly, with very few exceptions, for the most part, the legal discourse of, of the Qur'an or the social laws of the Qur'an, here are the rules for marriage, here are the rules for inheritance, here are the rules for, you know, even fighting, here are the rules for zakat, here are the rituals for hajj, here's the rituals for fasting. All that stuff was not talked about in Mecca, that was talked about in Medina. So the, you can think of it as uh, Mecca is the world view, one way to think about that is, we talked about Iman. I'm using other language now. Mecca is about building the Qur'an's worldview. And then the Medinan Qur'an is about the Qur'an's legal code and the social code, the practical side. Okay, the so it's like theory and application kind of, right? That's, that's what it is. Assalamu alaikum. Before you begin this video, just quickly wanted to let you know that so much of the work on the Qur'an has been completed on Bayina TV. I want you to enjoy systematically studying the Qur'an from the beginning all the way to the end in brief and then in great detail. And to do that, I'd like for you to sign up on BayinaTV.com. And once you appreciate what's going on in Bayina TV, I want you to become an ambassador for it and share that subscription with friends and family and give it as a gift also. Thank you. If the opening ayat are talking about Allah and who Allah is and what Allah does, then that sounds like the worldview side, doesn't it? That's why they said this sounds mucky. So with that background, I want you to understand something about Medina. You probably already know this, but it's important to say this at the introduction because it will frame our understanding of what's, what, what this surah is talking about. Allah says, وَقُرْآنًا فَرَقْنَاهُ لِتَقْرَأَهُ عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى مُكْثٍ وَنَزَّلْنَاهُ تَنْزِيلًا The Qur'an, we broke it apart so we could send it down to you, meaning the Prophet them at their perfect occasion. Mukth means the anticipated occasion. What's in sports terminology at the clutch moment, right? That's the idea is when Quran came, it came at the most needed moment. And there were times where it wasn't the time to send the ayah, it was afterwards, right? It would come at that right time. Well, if this surah came in Medina, then we have to understand the moment because it came in that particular historical moment. One thing I want you to know about Medina is you can divide people by race or by tribe. So the Medina had tribes like Aus and Khazraj, or it had the Jewish tribes like Banu Qaynuqa, you know, Banu Nadir, right? Other tribes. You can, drive, you can divide people by race or tribe. You can divide people by their geography. Oh, these are the Muhajirun, these are the Ansar, people of Mecca, people of Medina. But we're not going to divide them like that. We're going to divide them in a spiritual sense. Spiritually speaking, the Muslims, not the non-Muslims, we're not talking about the non-Muslims right now. The Muslims of Medina were divided into three groups. The Muslims, I'm not talking about non-Muslims, I'm talking about who? The Muslims. The Muslims of Medina were divided into three groups. The first group, Quran's own words, As-sabiquna al-awwaluna min al-muhajirina wal-ansat, the first and the foremost, that belong to the muhajirun and belong to the ansar, the top tier, the top tier, right? The all-stars, the, the ultimate believers, the true sincere believers. They are, these, these people have proven their, their faith by being the first to show loyalty to the Prophet wasallam and to the, the, the demands that Allah makes. These are the top of the top among the Sahaba, both from Mecca and from Medina, both. Don't be confused. Sabiqun are not just from Mecca. Allah says, Sabiqun al awwalun min al muhajirin wal ansar. They're from both. They're, they're Sabiqun. The, the top rank believers are from Mecca and from, from also Medina. 
then we'll use the Quran's language, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ Those who followed them with excellence. So there are other, now the second group, I'll, I'll call the first group the truest believers. Okay, for simplicity, the truest believers. The second group, I will call them the Muslims. What am I calling them? The Muslims. That's not a bad thing, is it? No, it's not the greatest, but it's also not bad. They're Muslim, they've accepted Islam, they're doing their best, they're doing whatever they can, but they're not the first to, they're not jumping at the first opportunity, and they can also mess up sometimes. They can also make mistakes sometimes. They can also miss a prayer here and there. They might do something that's haram and then come to the Prophet ﷺ and say, I did this, what should I do? I, I messed up. So you'll find in Medina, there are Muslims who are good people, but they also fell into sin. They also showed weakness. They also sometimes didn't spend the way they should have or didn't show up for battle. That happened even among the Muslims. So the first category is the true believers or the truest believers. The second category is what? The Muslims. And they're kind of up and down. Just like us, up and down. Actually, a lot of times when people talk about the Sahaba, they paint the picture that all of them were in the same category. Right? And that's a mistake. That's not even historically correct. That's not correct according to the Quran. And it also creates a problem for us because then we're like, I'm no Abu Bakr, which means I'm going to hell. Right? So, <laughs> because if everybody's up here, then, then they're all the way up here and I'm all the way down underneath the basement. So I never going to get, you know, then there's nothing to relate to. But there's that middle category that I'm calling the Muslims. The Quran uses a word for them. I'll get to that last, actually. So how many categories did I tell you there are supposed to be? Three, right? I've given you two. The third category is hypocrites. Hypocrites. And hypocrites are two... The third category has uh, two subcategories. Three, one, number three has three A and three B. I need you to know both of them, okay? Three A is people who are not Muslim at all. They're just pretending to be. Spies, they're FBI, okay? They're agents. They're agents, they went into the Muslim community with no intention of actually ever accepting the religion truly, okay? وَهُمْ بِالْكُفْرِ قَدْ دَخَدُوا They entered with kufr. They came in with disbelief. They never intended to believe. وَهُمْ قَدْ خَرَجُوا بِي And they left with it. In fact, there was a scheme that Allah described in Surah Ali Imran, they, they came up with a scheme together. They said, look, the, some of the knowledgeable rabbis in Medina, they said, a lot of our Jewish brethren are becoming Muslim. And they used to think of us as scholars. So we should capitalize on that. Some of you knowledgeable Jewish leaders should become Muslim during the day. Go join the Muslims. And then by the end of the day say, look, we checked what the Torah says, we checked what he's saying, we thought he's confirming what the Torah says, but after further investigation, he's not really a prophet, and then you'll come out. And when you come out, then the, 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 the Jews that became Muslims, will, well, my rabbi did the research and he left, so maybe he's right about something. Maybe I should use his credibility to leave Islam too, that was their hope. That, those kinds of people, they entered Islam sincerely or with, already without Islam? That's 3A. People that are not Muslim to begin with and they pretend to be Muslim just to cause discord in the Muslim population. I believe a lot of, a lot of Muslims on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube Reels, a lot of them, I have a feeling that they're not really Muslim because they say some of the craziest things no Muslim has ever said. Like I've traveled the Muslim world and I know what Muslim crazy looks like. But the Muslim crazy on Twitter is some other level of crazy. That's, I don't know. I don't know. I had never, I had, I had never seen crazy like that. That's planted in just to create conversation among the Muslims and drive them crazy. I feel like. Allahu Akbar. Okay? Anyway, so that's 3A. But there's also what? 3B. 3B is people who came into Islam like, every, like the Muslims. Category 2. They're Muslim. 
But when they came in and Islam got demanding, they started feeling like, I didn't sign up for this. Like, this is hard. Wait, what, what do you mean I got I to gotta change the way I dress? Well I, well, I can't be friends with this person? We're just friends. He's just like my brother. Why, well, I can't do that anymore? Wait, we're going to, we're going to war? With Mecca? Bro, I thought Islam is peace. The meaning of Islam, peace. I heard that at a seminar. And now you're telling me we got to prepare for war? This is, I don't know about this. So they started stepping back. They came in sincerely, but when, they, when the, the dean started making demands, then they started retreating a little bit. And when they started retreating, they didn't want to feel like they're cowards or not committed. So they started creating, you know, when someone does the wrong thing, they have two choices. Either they can say, look, I'm messed up. I messed up. Those are the weak Muslims. That's category two. But the hypocrite, when they mess up, they're like, nah, it feels too bad to admit that I'm messed up. I'm just going to start talking about how everybody else is messed up. So the, the hypocrites will go, these Muslims will go to other Muslims who are spending in the path of Allah and say, are you crazy? Do you have any savings? Don't you have a family to take care of? Are you stupid? Why are you spending this much money? Why are you donating all of this? Are we going to believe like these idiots believe? Look at these guys. They're from Makkah, right? Oh, they're the best believers. All of them are homeless, bro. All of them are living on welfare with us. Have you seen this is what you want for your life? This is Islam. Allah doesn't want you to become homeless, okay? You don't have to be so extreme. In other words, instead of seeing the fault in themselves, they started finding fault in those who actually believe. And they, they're not spies. They're not spies, but they're covering their own inadequacy by projecting it onto the Muslims and demoralizing the Muslims and making fun of the Muslims. This is category, this is 3B. So I've given you now, it's supposed to be three, but now it's kind of turned into four, isn't it? So what was A? What was the first group? Number one, the truest believers. Those, what's two? The Muslims. Number three, hypocrites have how many groups? This is the Muslim population of Medina. Now let's compare this to the Muslim population when we used to be in Mecca. You know how many groups there were in the Muslim population in Mecca? Just one. The truest believers. That's it. You don't got no number two. You don't got no number three. You only got number one. That's all you had. Because the moment you came into Islam in Mecca, you got beat up. You got cussed out. You got humiliated. So nobody had, oh, I'm just going to see what it feels like. It, you didn't have that luxury in Mecca. You didn't have that luxury in Mecca. That, that is a phenomenon in Medina. You with me so far? Okay, now this introduction is really important because this introduction is going to help you not just with Surah Al-Hadid. It will help you with Hadid, Mujadala, Hashr, Mumtahina, Saf, mun, uh, mun, Munafiqun, Jum'ah, Taghabun, Talaq, Tahrim. From Surah number 57, all the way to surah number 66, this is the introduction. This is the introduction. Now, you with me so far, yeah? Okay. I got to keep track of time. Okay, I have a good, good amount of time, 24 minutes. Allah uses a phrase, I'll use the first part of it, to address the Muslims, to address everybody, the ummah. He uses, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Let me tell you something about Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. It includes three groups of people. That phrase includes three groups of people. When I say it includes three groups of people, do you know what I'm talking about already now? It includes the top tier believers. It includes the Muslims. It also includes the hypocrites. That is why I like to translate Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu with, I want you to think about it as those of you who claim to believe. Those of you that have actually accepted the faith, you've accepted the faith. Your intentions vary. Your commitment varies. Where you stand with it varies, but at least you've accepted it. Now, when he says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, you should not be mistaken that he's talking to only category one. He's talking to who? All three. Now, let me tell you one of them, one group. Who 
does, says one thing but does another? Which one of these three groups says one thing but does another? Three. Hypocrites. They say one thing and they do another. They're two-faced, right? Listen to this ayah. In Surah Al-Saf, this same series of surahs, he says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la tafa'alun. Those of you who have iman, why do you say that you, what, you, what you don't do? Wait. The people who say what they don't do are not the people of Iman. The people who say what they don't do are the hypocrite. hypocrites, aren't they? So the ayah should be, Ya ayyuhal munafiqoon, lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Ya ayyuhal ladhina nafaqu, lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. But that's not what the ayah says. The ayah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Why? Because this is very wise of the Qur'an. This is part of Allah's wisdom in the Qur'an. He covered all three groups with one phrase so the Muslims don't categorize each other. Allah categorizes them. Allah categorizes them in the Quran in three groups. But who doesn't get to categorize them? I don't. I don't get to go in my community and say, this, this is level one right here, that guy. This guy this is two, one and a half, okay. This guy is three, I don't know, if there was a four, he would be four, bro. You don't get to do that. And why don't you get to do that? Because to address all of them, what did Allah say? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Now let's add one more thing to this mix as we get, un we get ready for Surah Al-Hadid. Al Al you know, if you think of faith as fire, a fire in your heart, and a fire has heat, right? The people that have level one faith have the strongest fire, the people of level two, maybe they have a candle, not quite a strong fire. And the people at level three barely have a spark. There's something maybe left, but it's all, it's all gone. It, never, it was never there. You understand? So there's high temperature, mid temperature, and low temperature. Okay. In Makkah, if you, kid, if you gathered all the Muslims of Makkah in the time of Makkah, and you check the temperature, the temperature would be high or low. The overall temperature would be high. Now the Muslims move to Medina, and there are one, two, and three. If you, check, if you check the average temperature now, is the average temperature higher or lower? Now it's lower because there are people of lesser temperature here. What I'm trying to say in simple language is the overall faith of the community has declined. Because now they're all together, the hypocrites are among them, the weaker Muslims are among them, the, the senior Muslims, the, the, the mature believers are among them, but the overall, the, the, you know, the, the bigger picture, the temperature has dropped. These surahs, from surah number 57 to surah number 66, is the Quran's way of talking to a community where the temperature has dropped, and to help them raise the temperature. That this is the Quran's way of raising the temperature for that community. That's why some of them have to go back to the very basics. Because the, the heat of Iman that came in group number one came because they were they, the, the, the Meccan Quran was drilled into their hearts. For 13 years, it was drilled into their hearts. And now in these surahs, you will find some elements of what Quran? Of Meccan Quran, because the temperature needs to be raised again. Is that making sense now? And so we get this profound introduction to the surah of six ayat just talking about Allah. That's why we get that introduction. Okay? This, this surah is going to be, uh, I, I, we have a colleague, a student of mine, who also works on structure in the Quran. I'm a, I'm a huge uh, proponent of the organization of the Qur'an, I believe in the divine organization of the Qur'an. If you can see that the architect of this hall put these columns in the right place for the structure to be held up, and the stage was designed at a certain distance, there was a calculation made, a mindful calculation to put this building together. If a surah is a divine palace, as I describe it, yeah? Surah is a divine palace, then the placement of all of its ayat, the placement of its subject matter, the organization of thought, the flow of the ideas in a surah, none of it is random. All of it is designed by Allah. As Hamiduddin Farahi put it, the one who organized the, the bones on the tips of every one of my fingers and every ligament did not overlook organizing his own speech. Right? 
the one who organized every star in the heavens, did not overlook organizing his own kalam in the Quran. Right? So I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of understanding organization in the Quran. Within a surah, there's a design, there's a there's structure, and there are different ways to try to contemplate that structure, to, to understand something from that structure. My analysis is a little bit different from one of my students, uh, Munir's. I'll share both with you, but I'll, I'll tell you mine's better because it's mine. But I'll still share his. I mean, even though I'm not convinced of his as much, he's not convinced of mine as much. But in, in, the, in the interest of transparency, I'll share both. In my understanding, this surah is made up of six parts. The way I see the structure of the surah is made up of how many? Six parts. And our, what I'm going to do with you is I'm going to go through part one, part two, part three, all the way to part six. And every time we finish a part, we'll review it and we'll say, how was this part organized? Then we'll go to part two and then we'll re have a review session. How was part two organized? And then part three, how was that organized? And we'll just kind of start to appreciate the organization of what Allah is saying, the design of what Allah is saying. You know, in any education, organization of thought, isn't that important? In your courses, you take a 101, then you take a 102, then you take a 201, then you take a 202. Inside of a course, you first you do chapter one, then you do chapter two, then you use, there's organization of thought, right? So the Quran's own organization of thought is not like human organization. It's divine organization, it's different. And we should take time to appreciate it. That's gonna be part of our agenda too. Okay, so now that I've gotten that out of the way, some important things about organization. There's organization inside the surah, but there's also organization around the surah. Around the surah. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of things that are happening around the surah. I've already told you this is a group of surahs. From which surah to which surah? Hadid all the way to, anybody remember? Tahrim, good. 57 to 66. This is one bunch of surahs, okay? They're all revealed in Medina. They're all similarly sized. They're all talking to the same problem. And half of them, uh, Surah Al-Hadid, Surah Al-Hashr, Surah Al-Saf, Surah Al-Jum'ah, Surah Al-Tahabun, five of them are beginning with declaring that everything speaks to, everything announces the perfection of Allah. سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ سُورَةُ الْحَشَرِ سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ سُورَةُ الصَّافِ يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ سُورَةُ الْجُمْعَةِ يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ سُورَةُ التَّغَابُنِ So in half of these surahs, there's the, the opening is declaring God's perfection, declaring the perfection of Allah. But even within that, so I just, I'll make a couple of quick observations about that, that I want you to know. We'll dive deep, inshallah, hopefully today after Maghrib, into the first ayah. But what, what's interesting is there are only two places where Allah does the following. I'll, I'll give you the English so you understand what I'm saying. If I say, I know whatever you're writing down and whatever you're writing down. I know whatever you're writing down and whatever you're writing down. How many times did I use the word whatever? Twice. But if I said, I know whatever you're writing down and you're writing down. How many times did I use the word whatever? Once. Now listen to the English translation. Everything, whatever is in the skies and the earth declares Allah's perfection. Whatever is in the skies and the earth declares Allah's perfection. Now let me say it again. Whatever's in the skies and whatever's in the earth declares Allah's perfection. Is there a difference? The first time I said whatever, how many times? Once. The second time I said whatever, twice. Five surahs make this statement. But in two of them, Allah says, whatever's in the skies and the earth, whatever's in the skies and the earth, declares Allah's perfection. In all the other surahs, Allah says, whatever's in the skies and whatever's in the earth, declares Allah's perfection. Okay? So only Surah Al-Hadid, only Surah Al-Hadid has whatever's in the skies and the earth without the second whatever. It's only one whatever. And then the end of Surah Al-Hashr, you see, يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Whatever is in the skies and the earth declares Allah's perfection. One ma, not two ma's. Everything else is سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ So the question is, how come there's a ma missing? What happened in these two places? 
It's really interesting in the Quran, these small things also have a purpose. If you're used to one palace made by Allah, and you notice there was a man this side, and then you go to the next palace and you only notice one man, you don't notice the other man, you're like, hey, he did something different here. Why did he, was, is there, was there a ma here? No, there's not, it's not supposed to be here. That's the other one. So why isn't it here? You'll, you'll find something incredible. Every time the next ayah is talking about something going on on the earth. So this is ayah number one in most cases. This is ayah number one. Ayah number two, if ayah number two is talking about something going on on the earth with the people of the world, then you'll find a second whatever. You'll find a second ma focusing on the earth. Because if I say, I know what's in this bottle and what's in this bottle, then I went out of my way to focus on the second bottle, actually. Because I could have just said, I know what's in this bottle and in this bottle. I didn't have to say what twice. The fact that I said what a second time is unusual because I'm bringing unusual attention to the earth. You understand? Because you don't have to say it. You can just say whatever's in the sky is in the earth. So the second ma is unusual. And whenever you see the second ma, read the next ayah, it will be about something, about the people in the world, what's happening, a worldly matter. Every time. Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Quran and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much and pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Quran and the beauty of it the world over.